uh, for from the last skills, last skill systems point of view, which is to use latency, uh, especially latency distribution as a service indicator about the health of the system. Uh, and this is a subject that I think uh, has been uh, has undergone a lot of uh, phase of research, and people are very actively working on these topics. Uh, if you look at uh, Mr. Amarna's uh, past record, he has extensive experience in uh, software technology de development, and he has uh, managed uh, many uh, assignments. He he has actually he hasn't put his his past affiliations, but he has worked in many of the big size large scale large scale system companies actually. Uh, and I also understand he is an entrepreneur in himself. He has been successful in. Uh, Working with industries and startups in the academic environment. In fact, he is not new to the IIC ecosystem. He has worked. He had previously worked with IIC in some form a lot of years ago, and from then I think he went to overseas to do his studies. And I think from there he has been working for a long amount of time. And uh, I think it's uh, an option to get him over here that will learn about experiences about this entire decade of last systems, and I think he'll share the experience about the same also. So let's welcome. This. Hi. Good. It's uh, nice actually to see the room is not full for a change. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, if uh, the room was absolutely full, I would have had to pay a visit to the restroom actually. So, it's not that bad. Um, so, let's um, now this is. Um, actually an engineering problem which I'm very interested in and I personally worked on this um, so we'll talk a little bit about that but before that let's talk about me right um, who I am and where I come from and what I've done and so on and why I can talk about this with at least some degree of authority so I'm an electrical engineer who actually passed out of campus here over 30 years ago, a long time back. Um, and I've done a lot of stuff, but most recently I was a research scientist at UMD College Park, surviving on grants and not teaching. That was a tough life for four years. Um, I did some interesting stuff there though. Um, and uh, in 2005, well, I, after that I spent a couple of years at Amazon Web Services, where I was what is called a 2PTL. So 2PTL is a unique Amazon concept. It's quite interesting. 2PTL stands for two pizza team lead. Any of you have heard of two pizza teams? No? A two pizza team is a team whose size is limited by the number of people you can feed with two large American sized pizzas, which amounts to 10 to 12 people depending on the appetite. Uh, these teams are generally composed of one product manager, one program manager, one engineering manager, one architect, and a bunch of software engineers whose job is to go out and build out a service and they are measured by business measures. Okay, so they are responsible for not only building out a service, they're responsible for operating it as a business. So that's their job. So many of the services in Amazon are actually built out by 2 PTLs. Um, and uh, after that, I spent uh, about four and a half years at Yahoo. Uh, because I got tired of being a manager, I decided to be an architect for a while. So I wound up managing all of the search advertising systems and some portion of the display advertising at Yahoo. And these are the systems that basically earn the revenue for the company, at least a major portion of it. At the time that I was there, search advertising earned about half of Yahoo's six point or billion dollars of revenue. Um, and uh, um, after that, and there was a lot of chaos at Yahoo before Melissa turned up. I quit and I joined uh, Samsung. So I was at Samsung Electronics for the past three years. And uh, I just quit Samsung in April of this year. Okay. So as for what I was doing, well at UMD the project, I mean the thing that I'm most proud of 
actually is building the control and monitoring system for an array of radio antennas. Any of you know anything about radio astronomy? It's a very, very interesting field. And it's interesting because the signal strength is extremely low. Okay. The total amount of energy that you get over a year of observing with an array of radio antennas will barely power a light bulb for about a minute. That's it. So the signal strength is really low. Furthermore, if you're working with radio antennas, this means you're working in the radio frequency range. So there's a huge amount of interference, especially with cell phones all over the place these days, right? which are on the microwave range. So this requires real precision engineering to do signal detection and actually extract meaningful information. So from an engineering standpoint, this was actually an extremely interesting project. Also from a data perspective, this was interesting because the antennas generated about a gigabyte of data every half minute that had to be collected, stored, and analyzed. So that was another piece that I also worked on, which is quite interesting. Uh, I spent uh, about three years doing that at UND. And the antennas actually worked for, uh, let's see, something like from 2005 till about 2014. So they actually worked for about nine years before being shut down. Recently, I believe it got shut down because another array got built, which kind of provided uh, the same functionality in the same hemisphere. Um, and at AWS, Amazon Web Services, I worked on what's called a transaction risk management system for flexible payments. So Amazon has this thing called flexible payment services, which handles micropayments, payments from banks, payments from credit cards, all that kind of stuff. And it's available to developers so that they can use it to you know, build payment uh, stuff for their websites and so on. Um, and I built the transaction risk management system, which means it looks at the regulatory aspects of payments. It looks at handling risk because every transaction is essentially an extension of credit to the person who's buying, right? Until you actually get the money. So you have to evaluate the risk to figure out whether you want to allow the transaction to go through or not. Uh, so we built that. And at Yahoo, as I said, I was the global architect for search advertising. And one of the things that turned up while I was there is, I don't know if you remember this, but in 2009, Yahoo signed an agreement with Microsoft that Microsoft would power all of their search advertising. Right? So in 2010, uh, the engineering part of it started, which was to switch all of Yahoo's search advertising over to Bing, right? to Bing's backend. Uh, and that project had to be completed because of contractual agreements in a period of six months for the US. Uh, that was quite a monster because it involved over uh, 4,000 people, engineers, program managers, everybody across two companies globally, right? Uh, about 30 or 40 data centers, over a million servers on the Yahoo side. On the Microsoft side, they were pretty secretive, so I'm not too sure exactly how many there were. Systems had to get built out on the Microsoft side. New systems had to get built out on the Yahoo side. We had to do the migration without upsetting any of the search advertising revenue. Right, so that was quite a challenge. And in Samsung, I uh, worked with the Samsung Knox team. How many of you have heard of Knox? Samsung Knox is the enterprise mobility product from Samsung, which works on the Android platform. So essentially Android back in 2011, 2012 was seen as insecure, right? It's not very secure. A lot of malware, a lot of junk on it. So companies didn't want to use Android. They'd much rather use Blackberry or iOS. So this was Samsung's effort to actually make Android secure. How many of you have heard of Android for work? Heard of that? So Google's work on Android for work actually comes from 
Samsung Law, which was a couple of years ahead, actually. Uh, so we built out the secure version of Android, built in manageability and administrative uh, features, and allowed it to get integrated with enterprise systems like Active Directory and all of that. So this was, again, a fairly mammoth project. Uh, we had uh, five global sites and teams all over the place working on this. So this was also a fairly exciting time. So in short, I've worked with internet scale systems, right? fairly large ones. Um, I've worked as both individual contributor, as a manager of teams, as someone who's managed businesses that run on them, all of that. So I'm going to talk about, essentially, how one uses uh, tail effects to operate these large-scale systems. So first of all, what is a large-scale distributed system? Right? Everybody talks about large-scale, right? big data, all that kind of stuff. So what is large? In the context of this talk, at least, I'm talking about infinite scale. That means millions of servers. Right? The search advertising system that I had managed had one million plus servers. And that's the search advertising part, not the search part. Search is separate from search advertising. Okay. Those systems had thousands of component services. And they were all geographically scattered. The search advertising systems occupied over 30 data centers globally. And globally, I'm talking all the way from Asia, Australia, US, Europe, right? Africa, I think, was the one continent, and of course, Antarctica, where we didn't go. But other than that, we had servers all over. There was also a lot of redundancy. Right? We had uh, systems in multiple data centers that provided the same functionality in the same services, so that when a data center failed, it could switch over transparently. So that has implications too, because you can't do that unless you transfer state across all your redundant systems. The transference of state across all those systems in a manner that is near real time is also not trivial. And of course, there's a bunch of other systems that manage that. And uh, each data center used to get hit by billions of requests. In the US alone, we got over 1 billion search requests a day, all of which had to be also serviced in terms of ads and so on. And that is uh, given that Yahoo was the third largest search advertising system at the time. You have to remember that that wasn't even the largest such system globally. Right? Google is even bigger than this. <clears throat> so now the other issue here is also availability. You're running a business on this worldwide, 24 hours, seven days a week. There are always people accessing the system. You can't afford to go down. Right? And availability here is not just that your service is not available. Availability also means that your service has to be functioning correctly. In other words, there's nothing going wrong that makes you lose money. That also shouldn't happen. So when you look at availability, we had to actually guarantee five nines availability. As you can see, five nines availability is 31.5 seconds of downtime in a year. That's pretty non-trivial. Uh, you take a look at any of the services of um, our local internet startups, how many of them have this kind of availability constraint or satisfy this kind of availability constraint? There are very few that can actually do that. 
to guarantee this kind of availability, that means you need infrastructure that works, all of your component systems must work, and you have to figure out if something fails fast enough that you can go fix it or switch it to redundant system. <coughs> In other words, you have to be able to detect when your systems are misbehaving. And you have to do this across millions of servers, right? How do you do that? That's not trivial. If I just go around and monitor CPU and memory utilization and all of that across the servers, I'm going to get lost. The other thing here is we're dealing, most of these systems, um, at least up until the time that I left Yahoo, though they were moving to the cloud, most of them were built with unreliable systems. Right? I'm using commodity servers. These are not special purpose built. These are not Sun Blade servers and all that kind of stuff. These are just normal old HP or Dell servers. So, how do you do this. Right? This means that there is failure, correct? One percent chance of failure over a set like this is means that components are going to fail with near certainty. There's no question of components not failing. They are going to fail. Your problem is how do you design so that you can handle the failure? And number two, how do you operate so that you can detect and manage the failure? Let's take something like hard disk failure. Right? Normally, you don't see that if you're operating on your laptop or whatever. But, and if you look at data sheets, you'll find that the normal figure that they give you is about 1% chance of failure over a year. Now, the problem with that 1% is that for a set of 100 disks, your failure probability is already 0.63. You can calculate that yourself. Right? If I have a 1% chance, 0.1 prob I mean, uh, 0 0.01 probability in other words. Across 100 failures, chances are one in, greater than 1 in 2 that I'm going to get a failure. Over thousands, it is pretty close to 1. Close enough to 1 that there is no difference. So, the other thing you also have to watch out for is user experience. Right? One of the things that at Amazon they keep drilling into you is that if your pages do not render, if they don't, if you don't provide your user response within 0.8 seconds, users will navigate away and go to some other website. They'll get impatient. Okay. So this is uh, data from history and also from user studies and all kinds of other stuff. This is a known fact. In India, people are a little more patient with broken infrastructure and stuff like that. But even here, if I'm going to take over a second to a second and a half, I'm going to navigate away and go somewhere else to get my stuff. So you can't afford to compromise on response time. Right? And that means you have pretty tight SLAs. So typical SLAs statements are like this. Right? That 99% of my service has to respond within so and so time. That's what I have to design for. That's what I have to operate my systems to guarantee. Right? Across all these millions of servers and thousands of components and so on. And you really have control only over the system services and components that exist within your own data centers. You can't you don't have that much control over what happens on the wide area network, what happens to your, because of hassles with your service providers or a cable getting broken and all kinds of other stuff. Right? You have some influence if you're a global internet scale player. Like Google has a lot of influence over uh, service, what service providers do and how they actually handle their wide area networks and content provisioning and so on. That's true for players like Yahoo and Amazon as well. But that's only influence. That doesn't mean that you have control. So these are the reasons why it's important 
for you to monitor and figure out where things are going wrong in your set of servers and components that provide you services. So how do you figure out that things are going wrong? In other words, what you're doing is you're looking for sustained SLA and availability breakages. There may be transient things, but ideally you want to ignore those, right? Because they are transient. You really want to focus your attention on the big things. So if something is broken for, you know, a few hundred milliseconds, that's okay. That can be accommodated in your availability thing. But anything that goes over a second, 30 seconds, you really want to know about. Um, and ideally, you don't want to monitor, as I said, millions of, you know, uh, CPU utilization, memory utilization, hard disk full or not, and all kinds of crap like that. Millions of variables, no way you can monitor that. It's humanly not possible. Uh, even writing programs to sit there and look at those millions of variables and figure out what is relevant and what is not, is a major research problem. And probably, I don't even know if it's worth solving also. Anyway, that's a different problem. So ideally, what you want is some small set of variables, right? That can be monitored to isolate anomalous behavior. That's what you want. You don't want to go around looking at everything. You want to look at some key indicators. So in other words, you have a needle in the haystack problem. How am I going to detect that needle in the haystack? What am I going to go look for? Right. So, what would you do? So now I'm asking you guys, what would you go look for? Sampling. What sampling? Random sampling. Random sampling of what? So parameters. What parameter? That is the question, right? How would you do that? I mean, a lot of these services also do have random sampling in the sense that there are external third-party services that will actually make calls to the website or to API services or whatever and determine whether they are reachable or not externally, right? In other words, whether they are up or not. But that kind of thing happens maybe twice or thrice a day. So the intervals are few and far between and still don't satisfy your need to identify anomalous events from an availability perspective, right? Remember, your downtime can only be 30 seconds in a year. I can't sample at that rate. So what can I do to find out and predict, right? That's the problem. <clears throat> so to do that, let's take a look at what request response looks like, right? This is a very rough figure. So, uh, but essentially what happens is you're going to get a request and I've kind of simplified this very heavily. Uh, in practice, there's uh, various, oops, where's the pointer for this? Ah, okay. There's various things on the top here that will actually do global routing and so on. And there's other uh, uh, web servers and other uh, things to defend against DDoS attacks and various other things. But anyway, once the request reaches my main server, then a thread of execution is going to begin in the server. That thread could then branch off to other component services because most of these are not going to be executed just in a straight line. It will actually make calls to multiple services based on the data input. So a lot of these calls will, whoops, a lot of these calls will essentially happen conditionally, right? It will call some of these, and some of these may call databases, some of these may call other services, and so on. So you'll essentially see a tree of some sort, okay? Or maybe even a DAG of some sort. And the response that comes out is essentially going to be the sum across all these. So, 
what does the response time for the entire service now look like? Right? The response time is evidently going to be the sum of the response times across all my component services plus my main execution thread. But response time is not a nice little single number. It's actually a distribution. If I look at it across requests, I'll actually get a distribution of times. It's not a constant. And the most common mistake that is made is looking at it from an average time perspective. Averages are the wrong thing to use. Because when you're talking about hundreds of thousands or millions of requests and you're worried about SLA, what's really important are the outliers, not average time. So, essentially therefore the response time that's seen externally is actually a random variable in some bounded interval, ideally hopefully within my SLA, which is actually a sum of a bunch of other random variables. In other words, it's roughly like this, and this is, if I remember correctly, this is the only equation in my entire talk. Um, now, as um, I have been looking for literature on this topic for some time, and I can tell you that there's very little literature on this. For the most part, because most publications happen internally. There's only one paper that I know of that's been published by Jeff Dean and uh, Larry Barroso, I think, in CACM in 2013 on tail effects and how to use them. Of course, the focus on that in that paper is more about how to fix uh, variations so that I can reduce the variation in the tail and keep my SLA bounds. Uh, this talk has a slightly different focus. But uh, there are very few papers in this area as far as I know, and there's very little public information about models in this space as well. Actually, I think it's a very interesting area to build models in. The problem is the availability of data. There are very few services that operate at this kind of scale, and the services they do, they don't make their data public. So, not that easy. Um, right. So response time distributions in large scale systems exhibit long tails. And the reason they exhibit long tails is because you have failures due to unreliable components. Number one. Number two, you have failures also because of software bugs, which a lot of people don't talk about, but it happens. If I have a few billion lines of code running all over the place, there's going to be bugs. And those bugs will cause will sometimes cause problems that actually show up in my responses. Okay. At least for some data sets. So, and also I can have bugs because of other reasons. For example, there was uh, one time I remember that a major service went down simply because some guy in the data center decided to unplug a router that he thought was redundant. It turned out that it brought down a whole bank of servers which brought down a whole service, which happened to be the component service for another bigger service. Therefore, that one went down. So it just had a complete cascading effect. So this sort of thing also happens, right? Human error as well. So um, anyway, coming back to this, as long as components keep running, um, but there may be a server that fails or a hard disk that fails or a CPU that gets overloaded, you'll actually see long tail. Right? In other words, the response time for some set of requests may actually extend beyond my SLA. And long tail distributions, interestingly, are also sensitive to variations which are local in time. In other words, if I have some anomalous behavior that lasts for a few hundred milliseconds, that will interestingly actually show up in the tail if you're monitoring that at that time scale. You can actually see the variation, you know, in the tail. It's very interesting. Um, so, given that we have these two points, the other thing is systems that are subject to heavy load, which can also happen. 
because ideally what happens is when you build out these systems you try to build them out so that you have optimal usage in other words when it is non peak time you want to ensure that your systems are running at something like somewhere between 40 and 60% utilization otherwise it's not economically viable i mean if you have systems that are running at 2% 3% that essentially means that you have rack space that's getting occupied by things that are not generating enough business for you not generating enough interest in users that's a problem so you want to make sure that you put enough services on those boxes that you're actually running at that kind of utilization that in turn means that at peak load time some of these are going to be subject to heavy load right nowadays of course you manage those in a slightly different way because of the cloud and so on you can actually pull in systems transparently a little more transparently than you could um and these are uh sensitive to localized load so what i mean is if, if you have a system which is running at 90% right that means that essentially the resources on that system are already heavily used right now if i dump some more load on it i put more requests on it and take the load up to 95 96% what is going to happen is that the response time for those last few requests that are put on will actually extend quite a bit because they'll be waiting for resources somewhere in the cycle right they'll be waiting for disk they'll be waiting for network they'll be waiting for just plain old cpu okay so what this means is that we can actually use tail effects right since tail effects are actually sensitive i can actually now use them as a monitor right so i'll look for changes in tail of the distribution over relatively long periods of time because i don't want to look for transients right like i said i'm not interested in running after every single variation which lasts less than a second it's not worth it just too much of a cost for me so i'm really interested in the stuff that lasts over time because that's where there is real breakage that i have to go take a look at and investigate and oops okay so this is non trivial for large scale systems again so if i look at typical curves right uh, this is a plot um so i don't have real data here i'm simply plotting curves Uh, which i remember from experience so don't assume that this is real data however the curves do look like this okay um this is a curve that is roughly like a 1 minus a e power minus k x kind of distribution where the whole thing is positive uh and what this is showing is this is showing um what we used to call a scaled histogram i mean a cumulative histogram So what this means is um on this side if you see this shows the time which is taken by 95% of the requests okay this is the time which is taken by 50% of the requests and this is the time that's taken by 10% of the requests okay does that mean sense okay and these are systems that have different slightly different design parameters and slightly different configuration parameters and so on okay in general you'll actually see something more like this than like this okay you don't really want this kind of system because with this kind of system you're already operating at close to peak even at something like 20% of your cumulative requests so you don't have too much flexibility left you really want to be operating somewhere in this region So what you monitor is actually this portion of the curve. What you monitor is what is the time that it takes for 99% of my requests, what is the time that it takes for 95% and what is the time that it takes for 90%. So depending on the SLA, you basically look at these three and you monitor what's happening. and you do this not just for your main service but you also look at it 
you have the data for component services as well, right? So what does it mean if these times increase? If these times increase, that means that there is something wrong somewhere. Right? Resource utilization is getting affected somewhere. Some resource has dropped out. In other words, the box has failed, right? So somewhere something is operating out of your design parameters. That's what it means. And you can isolate that as well, right? Once you know that you're seeing anomalous behavior, then I can drill down on the component services and figure out which ones of those are exhibiting funny behavior. Once I know which ones those are, then I can drill down to actually server them and figure out what's going on. Once I've got it down to a bunch of servers, I can look at other metrics. Then I can look at disk utilization, CPU, all that stuff. And figure out what went wrong, where, how, and fix it. That's the idea. Furthermore, once you have this kind of thing built out, there is also the possibility of automating all this. Right? Once I have a system that produces the data, I can now build another system that will actually monitor this, look for anomalous behavior, and take action based on the nature of the anomalous behavior that is observed. Which is something that was also done. But that's the approach. So in other words, by just looking at one thing, I can actually figure out what's happening across a whole set of servers across multiple locations geographically. Now this sounds nice and simple, but in practice computing this is non-trivial. Right? Remember, we are talking about billions of requests coming. Okay. So per hour we are talking about a few hundred thousand requests coming in. Maybe even close to a million requests coming in. How am I going to compute this easily? Computationally, that's not an easy problem. In fact, the first few MapReduce algorithms were built primarily because Google wanted to look at latency numbers. If I have a billion of these integers floating around, they don't fit in one machine. How am I going to compute media? Right? I need some other distributed way to do this. And that's where essentially MapReduce actually came from. Okay, so any questions? Does all this make sense or not make sense? I actually opened my eyes to this long tail distribution because around several years ago somebody gave me a problem to work on this more from a from tweets point of view, Twitter tweets point of view, oh, and that okay. doesn't make sense to me. Like, why should I look at the long tails? Because for me, Twitter, you typically look at the most prominent uh, events happening. For the head is the more important part of the tails. So I basically gave up that. <laughs> so that was supposed to go to my internships, mm -hmm. and I said I'm discontinuing because the problem is so badly formulated. But then I see that's mm -hmm. a new angle to over here. Long tails are, in fact, uh, the e-commerce business is actually based on the long tail as described by Chris Anderson. Have you read that? So the idea is that in e-commerce you're taking advantage of the fact that you don't have physical shelves. Bookstores have physical shelves, which means, and that shelf space is expensive, right? In terms of, you know, infrastructure costs and people and all that, to maintain those shelves and all of that. So you will always keep stuff there that will actually have a quick turnover. In other words, you're gonna have bestsellers and stuff like that. So what about people with special interests and so on? Where will they find their books? They have to go search, right? If I, for example, am looking for a book on, you know, long tail distributions and power laws and all that, where am I going to find it? Not that easy. Whereas if I go to Amazon, I can actually find it. 
At Amazon, it turns out that the sale of books on special topics, if you accumulate across all of these small, 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 small topics at the tail, that total volume and sales generated is greater than what you get from bestsellers. So that's where the money is. Okay. <clears throat> Any questions? Comments? Anything? No? So the monitoring isn't uh, hardware supporting these kind of monitoring? Uh, no. You have to build systems to do that. Nowadays it's easier than when I started. Uh, in the sense that there are monitoring frameworks and so on that actually help you do this, right? There are systems like Nagios and Ganglia and so on that will actually help you do a lot of this stuff for large systems. But in earlier days, we actually wound up building the equivalent systems. Uh, I'm still a little bit unclear about how you can isolate sort of the localized systems that are generating the anomalous behavior by looking at just uh, the, the variables that you mentioned. Okay, yes, I skipped over a bit there. But yes, it's possible. So what you actually wind up doing is this. What you wind up doing is you actually store the uh, latencies, the latency distributions across each of these. In other words, I'm going to store my um, latency distribution, the same kind of curve that I showed you earlier. I'm monitoring it and storing the data not just for this, but for each one of these as well. Right? And then what I do is when I find an anomalous behavior at a certain point in time, I'll come down and look at these for the same window. Right? And based on where I see similar anomalous behavior, I will then drill down further. Right? So Again, one level more. You're basically narrowing your window. Absolutely. I mean, not the when I say window here, I was talking about the time window. Right. But here what you're doing is you're basically narrowing it down to the component services that are involved. Right? Once you figure out which component services are the ones that are showing that behavior, then I can drill down further. Right? Yes. I mean rather I would say you look at where the maximum contribution to the anomalous response time is coming from. Right. And that's what you go after. Any other yeah. So what would be the case in which like if all these component services have been running in different systems? And since if they are running in different systems, there is some sort of rounded time between the query and response. Okay. Is there any good algorithm, some good approach in which we can reduce the latency and rounded time to have a better results on the searching? Well, that's kind of... No, so the round trip time... Um, okay, first of all, let's say um, this problem aside, right? I think your question is is kind of coming from a different angle. Yeah, for right? like, like considering these are, are running in a single system which has inter-process communication. No, they're not. These are all running in different systems. So in the They case, could even be running in different data centers. Yeah, so in that case, how can that RTT affect your latency and is there any way to overcome and reduce some sort of... Uh, no, I mean, the RTT... Right? So, let's put it this way. By design, the RTT is what it is. In other words, you're basically using the fact that, for example, uh, it takes, uh, let's say, 140 milliseconds to go from uh, a data center in Virginia to a data center in the UK. Right? So you'll build that into your design to guarantee your 300 millisecond SLA. Okay, that is taken into consideration. Yes, prior that's how you do that. Yes. Because these are all physical constraints. I mean, you can't do anything about it. If it takes 140 milliseconds, it takes 140 milliseconds. That's the network congestion that you have to deal with. You have no influence over that, as I mentioned earlier. Right? Unless you are willing to lay your own physical infrastructure, which is just too, way too expensive and not worth it. There are 
but um, having said that, there are ways to reduce latency for certain kinds of requests, certain kinds of things and so on, right? Where caching can help, you can use that. Um, but those are all limited solutions. Okay, they don't work all the time. And where your cache has to get refreshed, well, too bad. Your request cycle time is then going to go up drastically. Anything else? Yeah, there could be. I mean, I just drew a very simple diagram here. Sure, there could be, right? Instead of this guy calling this, this guy could be calling this. Sure. But from our point of view, it's just another component service, right? For that request. What I'm trying to say is that each request has its own subtree, spawns its own subtree of subsidiary requests. So, okay. Now the other interesting thing about this. So how many of you here are computer science guys? Okay. <laughs> I was once, but I don't do it that often <laughs> these days. These days, all right. Okay. So, um, I am an electrical engineer. And one of the things that is of interest to me is that this whole technique was actually discovered by electrical engineers who were looking for ways of making the system observable. Any of you familiar with the concepts of observability and controllability? Essentially, that's what you're trying to do here. Okay? It's an observable system, yes, but you're trying to find the minimum set of parameters to observe that will give you some information about the internal state which is not the way that a computer scientist thinks, in my experience. Okay. How can we design such system for large scale learning? Is there any smart approach to give on model driven approach So those are all techniques, right? The first step is to decide what your service has to do and how it has to do it. So from a design perspective, your first step is to figure out functionality and what are the constraints within which you're going to deliver that functionality. That means what is the SLA, what that service has to do to deliver that functionality. In other words, what are the tasks it has to execute irrespective of whether I implemented in Java or Scala or whatever, right? There's some basic stuff it has to do to deliver the functionality. For example, in the payment system, I have to authenticate the user, I have to get the payment instrument details, I have to get the transaction details, then go and actually execute a payment call at a payment gateway, get the result, come back. These are things I have to do anyway, right? So first step is figure that out. Then I have SLA considerations. Right, which are my constraints. Once I have SLA considerations, if I have to execute all this within, let's say, 250 milliseconds, I now have to allocate how much time I'm going to give for each task. So each task can take no more than that time. If it does, then I have a problem. Then I figure out how to design each piece so that I will get that time. That is where I'll start thinking about technology. So first step is get a clear problem statement with constraints. Once you have clear constraints, problem statement, then figuring out solution becomes simpler because your options are much, much smaller. Okay. What type of products are there in the research scope to analyze the table? Um, there are some. For example, there's there's a lot of work in mathematics, 
if you're interested in that sort of thing on power laws and tail effects there okay there's a whole review paper actually i don't have the name with me right now but i can uh, send that over to prashant later but there is a lot of work there that talks about power law distributions and how to determine if something is a power law distribution right and what kind of power law distribution it is based on that you can do certain things and so on that's one um the other thing which um, is interesting in terms of models is um the basic approach for looking at all this is queuing theory right you must be familiar with that i mean performance modeling in most computer systems ultimately winds up in queuing theory somewhere right so there is a bunch of papers that deals with um long tail wait times in queues right and how to deal with those how to model those how to analyze them right um i don't know if i have that paper Um, hang on. Let me see if I have that paper here somewhere. Uh, oops. This is too big. Uh, I hate this. Let me just get out of here for a minute. Um, I think. Just give me a minute. Let me just find this thing. have a paper here but i can't well, never mind i'll find it later but there is a paper um uh, i remember right it's some 40 page paper which deals with this how to use laplace transforms to look at um uh, queues that have uh, long tails ah oh, there it is found it let's see if i can uh, connect this again oh oh should it take ah there we go that's just like the old paper 1983 but it's interesting mm really i found it useful when i was looking at it in terms of modeling a nice way of looking at uh, figuring out what or at least trying to figure out what a long wait time somewhere means Well, yes and no. Remember, there is a cost to that, right? I cannot do this uh, infinitely. In the sense that ultimately there are a finite number of resources that I'm dealing with, right? And for every extra resource that I use, I have to pay. Then come for free. So therefore, there are going to be limits based on my cost structure. Given that. i do have to deal with this the other problem is not all failures may require me to switch over because switching over also has a cost right that doesn't come for free either that means that some request somewhere could get thrown out i could have some minor availability issues all of this stuff so not everything can be resolved simply by throwing it at another server or another vpn i will therefore have to look at what went wrong that's one second thing is i also want to figure out what went wrong and where because i want to make sure that it doesn't happen again right 
which means I need some mechanism of detecting and isolating the problem. So that need doesn't go away. Does that answer your question? So if you have no other questions, so we can probably wrap up the session. So we we'll thank the speaker once again. So there's like snacks, a niche for your upstairs.